Hello, everyone, and you're very welcome, wherever you are, to this National Missing Persons Day event, a virtual event to honour all our missing people. I welcome everybody in whatever way you are watching, be it on the Department of Justice website or on Facebook or on Twitter, for this virtual event. We'll begin our event in just a moment by going to Farmley, where it began for all of us back in 2013 on that first National Missing Persons Day. Well, over at Farmley now, the candle has been lit to remember all missing people. The welcome fire has also been lit. We'll begin our ceremony now, remembering all our missing people. Vakarja, Watham Falcha Kor, Riv Gokdena Quig on a Kaid, Spashilta anew. Hello, everybody. My name is Barry Cummins, and you're all very welcome to National Missing Persons Day. This is the eighth such day. National Missing Persons Day 2020 is a very different occasion to the other seven times that we have gathered to remember and honor all our missing people. Today's event is virtual. I would like to welcome, firstly, all the families of missing people. And I think of people from Donegal to Wexford, from Antrim to Kerry, beyond our shores and on this island. You're all very, very welcome. I'd also like to welcome Minister Helen McEntee, who is joining us in her first occasion to visit National Missing Persons Day. I also welcome Garda Commissioner Drew Harris, who's returning to be with us today. We have a number of other contributors who will be speaking today. I'd like to thank them all in advance for their time in speaking with us. All of our contributions have been done while adhering to all the public health guidelines, maintaining social distancing. This is a time like no other. COVID-19 has changed all our lives and we were determined that National Missing Persons Day would continue, and we found a way to do it. And beyond today, there's a determination that even in the midst of a pandemic, publicity continues to be given to all missing persons cases where it can be, and that every effort be made to advance these cases. Wherever you are, we send virtual hugs and virtual handshakes. I know that on previous occasions, families would come together and give support to each other. And I know that the suffering endured by the family of a missing person cannot be adequately described, it cannot be summed up. And I know that it's only perhaps by meeting other families in a similar situation that there is some support there. The families get it, they don't need to talk about it to get it. And I know that we can't be together today, but online we are, we're all tuned in. We are all together. We're thinking perhaps of the times we've gathered at Farm Lee or at King's Inns. The latest figure that I have is that currently there are 823 people long-term missing in Ireland. A staggering figure, 823. 823 families longing to know where their loved ones are. 823 unsolved cases. Over the past year, there have been some cases solved. There have been significant developments in other cases. And we will describe some of those 
great advances today because they do give encouragement. They do give some encouragement that other cases can be solved and will be solved. But I am conscious that in the vast majority of cases, the vast majority of people who are joining us today, this past year has seen no new advancement, no new news, nothing. And hopefully, as we talk about some of the successes in cases and some of the advances that we might find a way to solve more cases. One of our speakers today will tell us about his brother who was missing for 73 years. Frank O'Neill will join us from Waterford to tell us about his brother, Jimmy, missing 73 years. And there are so many other cases of people who are missing for decades and decades. I would like to thank all of our contributors today. I'd also like to mention Ruth O'Hara, who's playing the beautiful music at Farmley, Ruth O'Hara on harp. So as we tune in and we think of when we gathered before, perhaps we can think of when we were at Farmley or when we were at King's Inns and when we were together. And today we will remember all our missing people. At this time, I'd like to invite Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, to address us. Minister. Good morning and welcome to this year's annual National Missing Persons Day Ceremony. I want to start by acknowledging that this year's ceremony is taking place in a very different manner than before and I am truly saddened that we cannot come together in person on this important day in our national calendar. I think it's fair to say that 2020 has been a year like no other with the onset and the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus culminating in a global pandemic. I know from speaking with people who have attended the previous Missing Persons Day ceremonies that Missing Persons Day has provided families and friends affected by the ambiguous loss of a loved one with comfort, with solidarity and with hope. Above all, a national day like National Missing Persons Day is there to ensure that your loved ones are never forgotten. It provides a respectful and a fitting occasion for families to speak about your missing parents, children, siblings and other relatives, not only publicly as ceremony contributors, but also privately with other families in the margins of the ceremony. And so I am so sorry that this special interaction with other kindred spirits, with people who have no doubt become friends in the most difficult and life-changing of circumstances, has had to be paused this year in the critical interest of public health. Social distancing seems a particularly cruel phrase for families, friends and communities that are grieving a missing loved one. In a year where we have all had to learn how to do many things differently, I do hope that this year's online ceremony will provide each of you with some sense of togetherness and unity with those who are travelling the same path as you and who are also watching in today. And I sincerely hope that next year we can meet again but that we can meet in person. Although this is my first time to participate in National Missing Persons Day as Minister for Justice, this year marks Ireland's 8th National Missing Persons Day and our 8th commemorative ceremony. I'm aware of the considerable momentum that has built up with each passing year of this important day and this is down to the commitment of so many family, friends and organisations, state and community and voluntary to Missing Persons Day. Today and in the leading days up to and following this day, a national platform is provided to those affected by ambiguous loss to raise awareness of Ireland's missing persons, to encourage those with potential information to come forward and to speak from the heart about their loved ones. I would like to start by thanking Peter Lynch and Frank O'Neill for speaking at this year's ceremony. Peter Lynch is the son of Tony Lynch, missing for 18 years until the discovery of Tony Lynch's remains was made in Loch Earn in May of this year. Frank O'Neill is the brother of James O'Neill, missing for almost 73 years. Peter and Frank will speak shortly, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart, thank their families for sharing their journeys and their experiences with us today. I briefly mentioned the support that National Missing Persons Day is so fortunate to have from the many varied organisations, and I would like to speak about these organisations this morning. 
I want to begin by thanking firstly Angarda Siakana and the Garda Commissioner Drew Harris, who is also, I know, speaking at today's ceremony. Thank you for your dedicated service to the families of missing persons over what has been an unprecedented year in policing terms. I would particularly like to thank the Garda Missing Persons Unit, local Garda stations and the network of family liaison officers around the country for their indispensable roles in the way in which they investigate missing persons incidents and support affected families. I also want to thank the National Missing Persons Helpline and Searching for the Missing, two organisations that continue to support families and friends of missing persons and are founding members of the collaboration that led to Ireland's inaugural Missing Persons Day ceremony back in 2013. Thank you. I want to thank the former pupils and the teachers of Davis College, Mallow, County Cork, who called for a National Missing Persons Day for Ireland and who are directly responsible for this event which we mark together each year. I would like to say a special thank you to Chris Enright. Chris is Director General of Forensic Science Ireland, but also Dr Renee Gabbert, Forensic Anthropologist, both who will speak at today's ceremony. Forensic Science Ireland has made a significant contribution to missing persons cases in recent years. As many of you may know, Ireland's DNA database contains valuable close family samples alongside profiles of persons whose identity is not known. The population of this database, in conjunction with the work of Forensic Science Ireland and on Garda Siakana, has enabled increasing numbers of missing persons to be identified in more recent years. These successes provide hope, hope for many families around the country, and again I want to thank Chris Enright and all of his team for their work. I want to thank Dr Gabbert for speaking at this year's ceremony, but also for raising awareness of the important role of forensic anthropology in missing persons case investigations. I'm aware that your role involves collaborating with a range of state organisations, again including Angarda Siakana and Forensic Science Ireland, and I want to thank you for sharing your experience with us today. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our neighbours in Northern Ireland who are also joining us today. Missing Persons Day is a whole of Ireland commemorative day and the support of affected families and organisations based in Northern Ireland for our commemorative day is strongly valued. I would like to welcome the Wave Trauma Centre, which provides vital cross-community support for families affected by the Troubles and has been doing so for almost 30 years now. I also want to welcome the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains. The Commission, through its steadfast work to locate all of the disappeared, really is a wonderful example of cross-border cooperation. I welcome also each of the families you so ably support who are here with us today. I want to pay tribute to the crucial work carried out by search and rescue organisations throughout Ireland and Northern Ireland, much of which is performed on a voluntary basis in support of local communities. Thank you for all that you do for the families, the friends of missing persons. The Esh Kjol, an association that has been a true partner to my department over the years in providing highly talented musicians to perform at previous ceremonies and this year is no exception and I would like to thank them once again for performing at this year's ceremony. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank our Master of Ceremonies this year and every year, Barry Cummins. Eight years on and Barry continues to give us his time, his commitment on a voluntary basis, raising awareness of missing persons cases at National Missing Persons Day. Barry contributes so much to the planning of the ceremonies, always with the families in mind, and this work is truly appreciated. Barry, we all thank you. And so I would like to thank each of you for joining us at this year's National Missing Persons Day ceremony. Although the format may be different, I really do hope that the event remains a meaningful one for you and I very much hope to be able to meet with many of you in person at next year's ceremony. I would like to especially thank all of the families who have joined us to commemorate your missing loved ones. This day is for you and this day is for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Helen McEntee. I'd also like to thank everybody in the Department of Justice who has worked so hard to make this day happen, this virtual event. It's taken a considerable amount of, of work behind the scenes to get everything together in the middle of a pandemic to get today to happen. But we were all determined that this event would take place. The first Wednesday in December is always National Missing Persons Day. And this year, 
was going to be like no other, but the event was going to happen and is happening. I'd like to thank Angie O'Neill and Roisin Gaffney in the Department of Justice. Also, I'd like to thank their Dara Brennan and Robert Hansbury, also Kayleen Murta, and also Bill Sweeney. I'd also like to mention Sinead Hessian, who has worked on some of the other National Missing Person Days on behalf of the Department of Justice and who gave advice uh, and uh, guidance uh, during the course of this year about how to make this event happen. One family that did get an answer this year was the family of Tony Lynch. Tony disappeared in 2002. For 18 years, Tony was a missing person. And as many of you know, Tony's family would have attended National Missing Person Day events and they would have urged the guardie and the media and everybody to do their best and then do even better, always trying to find where Tony was. This past year, the family finally got an answer and Tony Lynch thankfully has now been returned to his family and he has been laid to rest. The case is very instructive in terms of what can happen when a person disappears, where they may be, and how, even after 18 years, they can be found. Here to tell us more now is Tony's son, Peter Lynch. Peter. It's a pity it took 18 years to find him and him so close, him so close by, but it could have took another 18 or I could have took another 38. My name's Peter Lynch, I'm from County Fermanagh. My father, Michael Anthony Lynch, well, he was known as Tony. I'd go and I'd sit in the, up in the back of the digger with him, like, and I'd sit in it all day, and behind the seat, crammed in behind the seat all day, like, and a hot summer's day, like, and he was, you know, them kind of things I've never forgot about. We were missing on, in January, early January, 4th January 2002. I was missing for 18 years. Mentally, Dad would had issues like, and he'd had trouble with depression and that there. And um, I come home from school one day and there was a couple of my family members there. Nobody knew where he was, like, you know, he could have he could have went anywhere, like he could have just went away to work or he could have, you know. It was tough for my mother, like, and I've it was tough, you know, with younger siblings, like, and it was, it was tough on them, like, it was, it was tough on us all, like, but... The search had been ongoing from last January. There was a new yard came in, Sergeant Leach. He had put, put a lot of time into it, and between the civil defence and the guards of Monaghan, we started to do new searches and lakes and that with this new sonar technology, so we were looking for the car. Deep down, I still thought he was close by. Because of the COVID, they had to stop the searches because they couldn't send out groups of people to yell civil defence. So thankfully, there was a local fisherman from from Nublis here, John McAdoo, like we, you know, we can't thank him enough. Like I know, he doesn't realise what he, what, what he has actually done, like, you know, he happened to just come across where, where the slipway is, and he happened to just to see the to see a, a strange image on his on his sonar equipment. Probably the biggest hope we'd had the family had had in years. I answered the phone. I said, "I was just thinking about you today," and he he said, "Hope all was good," and he says, "Yeah, yeah, all was good." He says, "Yeah, what's up?" Not expecting, not expecting. He goes right. Well. We're actually out here at the minute, like, we're going to have to meet somebody with something to say, like, and I just look at you and tell me what, tell me what you have to say, and he goes, I'd rather see you face to face, I said, no, I, I need to know now, he says, we've pulled the car from Loch Aaron this evening, um, and we believe it's your father's car, it is your father's car. I didn't think it would have hit me even like that, you know, I just had never thought about it, I never knew what to expect, so... Dad's siblings are all still alive, all his brothers and sisters are all still alive, like, and it was nice once 
dad was found he and then everybody wanted to talk to him about him and it's great now like that there is a grave to go to you know it's I never thought we'd have that like I really didn't you need to keep having hope some bit of information will come up like and it will lead it will lead to something like you just need to keep you just need to keep at it like and we got not the exact answer we were looking for but it's it's good enough like it's good enough I hope that it gives hope to some of the other families. Thank you very much, Peter, for telling us about your family's experience. And I'm so very happy that you have finally got an answer and you finally got your father back. I think of other people who have disappeared and where a vehicle has also gone missing as well. And it's often struck me that perhaps an audit of every waterway in the country, river, lake, flooded quarries, assessing all of these areas might be very helpful in terms of some other missing persons investigations. It's a very easy thing for someone like me to call for this, it, but I, I do think there are people with local knowledge of areas and we have even better equipment, search equipment, uh, and so many people who are willing to help with searches that I hope more searches are conducted around the country and perhaps more answers can be found. One other case that was also solved this year was that of Theodor Brozko. And Theodor was originally from Poland and he went missing in 2014 in Galway. That same year, a body was found. It was Theodor's body, but he wasn't identified because people simply didn't join the dots. And it was only this year that two Polish men in Galway were able to tell Gardi that Theodor was actually missing from Galway and a DNA sample was obtained from his family and he has now been identified. His family back in Poland, all they knew was he was missing from Poland. They had no idea that he was actually in Ireland. The solving of this case, of Theodore's case, uh, came following all the advances in forensic science and it came following work by Gardaí and Forensic Science Ireland. So much is happening in terms of DNA advancements that are helping to solve some missing persons cases. Here to tell us more now is Chris Enright, Director General of Forensic Science Ireland. Chris. Many thanks, Barney, for the introduction. Firstly, I'd like to say that I'm privileged to participate at this year's Missing Persons event and to represent the work and support of Forensic Science Ireland over the past year. Although this year's event is virtual, I'd like everyone to know that FSI's support and commitment for missing person investigations have remained very real over the course of this year. We've remained open for all investigative work throughout the pandemic and have made some very good progress. FSI work closely with the Garda Missing Persons Bureau who combine DNA information and other leads they may have in the course of their investigation. In many cases, comparing the DNA profile of human remains to the profiles of relatives is the only way to get a conclusive identification. As of today, FSI have 516 DNA profiles of family members from 237 different families associated with missing persons on our national DNA database. We've uploaded profiles from 20 families so far this year, and we're processing samples from a further 14. In many cases, several members of the same family have provided profiles. This greatly increases our ability to confidently identify unidentified human remains. Volunteering a DNA sample can have a profound impact on identifying a missing person. Earlier this year, Stephen Corrigan's remains were found in red lines. Stephen had been missing since 2011. His late mother, Hannah, provided a DNA sample after his disappearance. Thankfully, we were able to identify Stephen by comparing the profile of his remains with that of his mother. Sadly, Hannah passed away before her son's remains were discovered, but the profile she provided many years ago led to the identification of her son this year. Over the course of this year, we've assisted in the identification of eight other missing persons. 
there, T- Theodore Brusco, Stephen Davitt, Tony Lynch, Milan Kissick, Patrick Healy, Kendra MC, Ross Williams, and Ross McBride. We hope that their identification brings some closure and relief to their families. We've been able to do this due to the hard work and commitment of FSI staff. Over the course of the year, we've introduced new DNA technology that allows us to better recover and analyze DNA from human remains. We've also introduced and validated new software that compares profiles from family members quickly and robustly. We're also planning ahead and we've invested in next generation DNA sequencing. We will constantly look at new technologies and capabilities to improve this service for missing persons. I'd encourage any family member of a missing person to provide a volunteer DNA sample. It's a straightforward and non-invasive process that takes no more than five minutes. Both Angarda Siakana and FSI remain very much open for business throughout the COVID restrictions and will be delighted to assist you in taking and processing a DNA sample. You can do so by contacting the Garda Missing Persons Bureau in the first instance, which can be contacted on 01 666 9476 or missing underscore persons at Garda.ie. Thank you for your time and stay safe. Thank you very much, Chris. And I wish you and your colleagues the very best as you continue your work at Forensic Science Ireland in 2021. I know there are over a dozen unidentified bodies in Ireland where uh, DNA samples have been obtained. I know there are other cases where DNA profiles haven't yet been obtained and only an exhumation will allow for a DNA sample to be taken. Uh, I wish you the best with, with all your work. I'm also conscious of the many hundreds of unidentified bodies that there are in Britain. And some of those cases, uh, some unidentified bodies have been identified as Irish people who have disappeared from Ireland. And it would seem that on a number of occasions, people would have entered the water in Ireland and their bodies were taken across the Irish Sea and washed up in Wales or on the Western coast of England. And through the advances in forensic science, a number of such cases have been solved. This year, the case of Patrick Healy was solved. Patrick was missing for 36 years before his body was finally identified thanks to forensic science this year. And Patrick had disappeared from Cabra in Dublin and his body had washed up in Cumbria in England that same year, but had been buried unidentified. But he now has been identified and his remains were repatriated this year. I'd like to thank Patrick's family for allowing me to share his story, which they see as a story of encouragement and support for other families of missing people. Again, even after 36 years, a case has been solved and In the publicity around the solving of that case, I was contacted by two women whose grandfathers disappeared in the late 50s and early 60s, two separate cases, but two men who disappeared from Dublin in and around that time period. So two women who had never met their grandfathers, but wanted to publicize the cases, wanted to learn more about how they might be able to give DNA uh, to help advance those cases. There are so many cases where uh, DNA can potentially help in, uh, in investigations. The Garda National Missing Persons Bureau is involved in taking DNA samples uh, and coordinating with local Garda divisions around the country as well. In the Missing Persons Bureau, I'd, I'd like to mention uh, Sergeant Carmel Griffin and thank her for her assistance in working towards uh, today's event. Also, uh, I'd like to mention Garda Daniel Keeney, and Susan Waldock in the Missing Persons Bureau as well. And the message from the Bureau is for families to get in contact with them. If they have any uh, queries in relation to their loved one's cases or any suggestions or simply looking for information about what's being done, the message is to give a call and to get in contact. And also in terms of giving a DNA sample, it's a very simple thing. It's, It's slightly invasive, but all it is is a swab on the inside of your mouth. And it's then there for the scientists to ever use to compare to any other cases and potentially uh, one day could help solve a missing persons case. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Frank O'Neill is missing his brother Jimmy for the last 73 years. 
It's a simply st staggering amount of time to be missing a loved one, 73 years. Many of you will know Frank. He has attended many National Missing Person Day events. He's a friend to many other families of missing people at this stage. So I'd like to thank Frank for speaking today. I'd like to introduce him now. Um, in Waterford City, we'd now, we're now going to hear from Frank O'Neill. My father died in 1966. I'd say truthfully with a broken heart of my missing brother, Jimmy, who went missing on the 15th of December, 1947, aged 16. Well, my name is Frank, Frankie O'Neill. I was the youngest of seven. James Malachy O'Neill, born on the 26th of November, 1931. He was the third in the family. A lady said to me in the same ward that she, my mother died in, she said, who's Jimmy? That was, that was a brother that went missing. And my, my mother was crying for him all night before she died. that only those that have endured it know exactly the unhappiness that it creates with a missing person. We wrote to so many different places through the courts of help and the Gardaí as well. There's times when you would ask yourself the question, why are those people that are out there that know something about missing people why are they depriving the loved ones of that little bit of leeway to try and advance their cause? You could relate to the Gardaí, you could relate to the social workers, there's so much amenities out there now at present. Without this help, the guards don't have too much. They need your assistance. They're giving you their assistance, but you, in turn, likewise, should give them your assistance. At least that we get restore some little bit of uh, leeway into where he is, where if he died, where is he buried, so that I can personally go on in my own time uh, to visit or whatever the circumstances may arise. You don't ever give up hope. Hope, as I emphasised before, is a major factor in my life. Keep up your spirits and talk amongst your family. Make sure that the person in question is never forgotten. For all the people that have missing people, we have this gathering every year and it's absolutely that we can relate to each other but we have the one thing in common we have the sadness and the loneliness here with us all today more or less speaking about what it happens the, it might be only a year it might be 5 10 15 20 and mine is 73. when you go on this day you meet people it's heartbreaking because what they're going through, I'm gone through, I have gone through, and I still go through. And I know what people, as I said previous, those parents that have been deceased, hoping upon hope that there'll be some restoration in knowing of where their loved one has gone to. All those people need happiness. They need some little form of advancement but they have one thing in common, a missing person. You're looking forward to wherever it is, in Farm Lee, in the King's Inn or wherever, but you're looking forward. I, am per I look forward personally for that day because you meet the people from all over. Don't confine yourself to loneliness speak about your unhappiness and you'll get some satisfaction there's enough there's enough people out into the world there's enough organizations that will listen i wish everyone 
happiness and hopefully, please God, that they'll, they'll have some rewarding things to their, their loneliness. Thank you, Frank, so very, very much for sharing your story with us today. And I wish you the very best. And I hope that you do get an answer in relation to your missing brother, Jimmy. And as I mentioned earlier about those cases where uh, women have been in contact about missing grandparents, younger generations have taken up the mantle in many places to publicize their loved ones' cases and to campaign on behalf of missing persons but also older generations as well. And Frank, uh, speaking on behalf of his missing brother, Frank, thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Today, we remember all our missing loved ones. We remember all the missing children. We remember Mary Boyle in Donegal, missing since 1977. Three years before that, John Rogers and Thomas Spence disappeared in Belfast. In 1986, Philip Kearns disappeared from Dublin. Amy Fitzpatrick is missing since 2008 in Spain. We remember all the missing women in this country, including Barbara Walsh, who's missing 35 years this year. We remember Jojo Dollard missing 25 years this year. That case is now a murder investigation. We remember Sandra Collins. Also, that is a murder investigation. Sandra is missing 20 years this Friday. We remember all our missing men, including Stephen Finnegan, Pierce Kremen, Eamon Mulligan, and Patrick O'Donoghue, all missing 20 years. We remember Trevor Dealey, missing 20 years next week. Today is a day when we do ask, what more can we do to help find missing people? It's also a time when we reflect. Now we remember, we remember, all are missing people. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth O'Hara at Farmley on harp today. Beautiful music. Thank you, Ruth. Gurav Mahakad. 
I've been reporting on missing persons cases for 25 years now. And one thing I have learned is you are always learning. There's always a case to stop you in your tracks, to shock you, to make you think again, to reappraise and to report in a particular way. And that happened this year with the case of a man whose body lay undiscovered for almost 10 years in Rath Mines. The body lay above ground, beneath trees in a busy residential area, close to where people would have walked by and driven by. The body was only found by chance. We now know the body was that of Stephen Corrigan, who was missing 10 years. And Stephen has now been laid to rest with dignity. One of the people involved in that investigation to solve the case was independent forensic anthropologist, Dr. René Gapper. I'd like to invite René to speak now. René. Thank you very much, Barry. Hello to Minister for Justice, Ms. Helen McEntee, and my fellow presenters, Garda Commissioner, Mr. Drew Harris, and Director General of Forensic Science Ireland, Mr. Chris Enright. Most importantly, hello to you, the families and friends of the missing. My name is Rene Gabbard, and I'm a forensic anthropologist. As a forensic anthropologist, I'm regularly involved in the investigations into unidentified human remains found here in Ireland. I carry out my work at the discovery site, where I assist the investigating officers' technical bureau and local scenes of crime officers in the search and recovery of human remains from various contexts, including accidentally found remains, exhumations and fire scenarios. The main purpose of my involvement is threefold, to maximize identification potential, to maximize evidence recovery and to maximize the humanitarian effort to leave no human tissue behind. After recovery, my main focus moves to the mortuary, where I regularly work in conjunction with the state pathologists in examining the remains. My aim is to record and catalogue all remains and examine all bones and fragments for potential identification markers and signs of injuries. I establish a biological profile of the disease. This includes the assessment of ancestry, the age at death, biological sex, living height and any health issues detectable in the bones. The biological profile is used to narrow down potential candidates on a missing persons list. After the examination, I remove targeted bones and teeth samples which are sent to Forensic Science Island for DNA analysis. An example of how forensic anthropologists work mostly behind the scenes is a case of discovered human skeletal remains in an urban setting in Rath Mines earlier this year. I was called to the discovery site to confirm that the remains were human and of a forensically significant time frame. I assisted Angara Shear Connor in planning the search and recovery phase and worked with the technical bureau over the next day and a half to recover the remains at the site. After recovery, the remains were examined by a state pathologist and myself in the Dublin District Mortuary. A biological profile was established and together with bone samples for DNA extraction handed to the investigating officer. Forensic Science Ireland successfully created a DNA profile for the deceased and it also recorded a match on the DNA missing persons database. The deceased was Mr. Stephen Corrigan, who was reported missing some 10 years earlier. Gardi and media efforts, led by Mr. Barry Cummins, succeeded in tracking down distant relatives of Mr. Corrigan and a funeral was planned. Distant relatives and friends of the deceased, officers of the investigation team and myself attended Mr. Corrigan's funeral. I just wanted to show you briefly how forensic anthropology is an important link in the investigation of unidentified remains here in Ireland, and also to provide a bit of information on how we, the people who may be the last ones 
who so intimately examine your loved one work. I hope it gives you a little bit of comfort to know about the large amount of effort and dedication the investigating teams bring to bear on each of these cases. And I must say, in all cases I've worked with Angada Connor, the officers have been extremely dedicated and professional and should be commended. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and special thanks to the staff here at the Department of Justice for their assistance. Thank you. Thank you, René. I know it was arising out of the National Missing Persons Day event that Stephen's mother actually gave her DNA on one of those occasions to Garda Richie Lynch. And sadly, Stephen's mother uh, passed away long before his body was found and then identified. But that simple act of her giving her DNA set and train the procedure whereby Stephen was finally identified. Her legacy was that Stephen's body was identified. I met some of the Guardi and Rathmines involved in that particular investigation and their professionalism was matched by their humanity. They really wanted to solve this case and get answers. And that's something I've seen around the country where Guardi individually and collectively have done such great work on behalf of missing persons. It's not always perfect, and there are many areas where things can be improved and should be improved. But many of the Gardaí, especially family liaison officers and many of the detectives around the country, uh, we all know the work that they have put into missing persons cases and the work that they continue to do and the more work that they want to do. I should also mention, as well as the Garda Missing Persons Bureau, Carmel and Daniel and Susan there, uh, that Inspector Ann Ellis and Detective Superintendent Jerry Murphy are involved in the Bureau and supportive of all the work there. And Chief Superintendent Declan Daly has plans that the Bureau be expanded and that the work be expanded. And there is so much work to be done there when you consider 823 long-term missing persons. I welcome today Garda Commissioner Drew Harris is with us again. And I invite Commissioner Harris to address us now. Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to join you all today to mark the eighth annual Missing Persons Day. We may not be able to meet in person this year, but our commemorative ceremony holds just as much meaning. And I'm glad that we have come together today to reflect, not just on each of your loved ones still missing, but on the terrible experience that you're each going through. At present, there are over 800 Irish people who are missing. And whether it has been months, years or decades, each one of these people remain deeply loved and longed for. Even with the passage of time, hope never recedes. The Missing Persons Unit of the Garda National Protective Services Bureau coordinate our investigations and advise divisional officers nationwide on missing person investigations. Gardaí with vast experience and expertise are working on open and unsolved missing person cases. Greater Garda focus is being placed on ensuring families are kept informed of the progress of investigations and we have developed international links via Europol, Interpol and in particular with the United Kingdom. Our multi-agency work can increase our ability to safeguard and prevent cases occurring in the future. The reasons why people go missing are diverse, but we have a duty to find out the truth about those who are missing. Without answers, there is a lasting trauma for you all. Today is a sorrowful day, but together we can hope and remember. I encourage those of you that are family members of any long-term missing person to consider giving a DNA sample to the missing persons unit or to your local Garda station. And I encourage anyone with information related to a missing person to please contact your local Garda station or the Garda confidential line. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I know policing in a pandemic presents particular challenges and I wish all Garda well going into 2021, in particular in relation to missing persons investigations. And hopefully, by the time we come to the next National Missing Persons Day, we are talking about more cases that have been solved. 
among the cases we remember today are those three of the disappeared people who were killed by the IRA and their bodies secretly hidden. I think of Joe Linsky, Columba McVeigh, and Robert Nyrak. Joe Linsky's body is buried somewhere in County Meath. Columba McVeigh is missing 45 years this year. His body is buried in County Monaghan. And Robert Nyrak's body is believed buried somewhere in North County Louth. The Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains says it believes all three can be found if the information is given. A reward for information in all of those cases is currently being offered. People do know where bodies are. People know. And I believe in amongst the 823 missing persons, there are several dozen which are actually murder cases. And in each of those cases, of course, somebody has information and could pass on that information. And even in the vast majority of cases where there is no crime believed involved at all, those hundreds of cases, I believe there are people who must have information and must have suspicions that could help as to where a person may have gone, why they went, what led them to a particular place, where they may be now. I think in the middle of this pandemic, we've all had so much time to ourselves and time to think and to reflect. And perhaps there are people in this country who've had a little bit too much time to themselves and they have some secret and they want to unburden themselves. I hope they find a way to contact Gardaí and tell what they know in relation to missing people. The message today is always to get in contact and to help families of missing people. I'm encouraged by the past year where links have been forged across the water as well uh, with some of the groups in England and in Wales and in Scotland in terms of missing persons cases and uh, very much that the support that's there in relation to uh, investigating cases beyond our shores as well. We're coming towards the end of today's ceremony. I'd like to thank everybody in the Department of Justice and in the Garda National Missing Persons Bureau for all their assistance. I'd especially like to thank Peter Lynch and Frank O'Neill for contributing to today's ceremony. I very much appreciate it. None of us knows what is coming in the next few months as we continue through this pandemic, but I do hope that the media and the Gardaí and everybody else who has some uh, position to help in missing persons cases continues to put missing people at the forefront of their minds going into 2021. More cases can be solved. I'd like to thank the Office of Public Works and everybody at Farm Lee for their support and uh, helping arrange today. I'd like to thank Ruth O'Hara, our harpist at Farm Lee, and we'll hear from Ruth again in just a moment as we conclude our sermon. I also would like to say you can re-watch uh, this ceremony uh, at a later stage as well. Uh, that's one of the benefits, I suppose, of the virtual ceremony. You can come back to this uh, at any time and, and watch again. Like every year since 2013, it is the releasing of the pigeons that will help to symbolize the end of today's ceremony. And we all know that the symbolism of the pigeons is that they know how to find home. Pigeons come home. I'd like to thank Paddy Maples and his niece Susan, who have traveled from Blanchardstown to Farmley to help release pigeons again for today's ceremony. I'd also like to thank Tosh Lavery, a retired Garda and friend to many families of missing people who has also assisted with the release of the pigeons today. I'd like to wish you all a safe and happy Christmas and hopefully we may all meet in person for the next National Missing Persons Day in December 2021. And hopefully by then we will have more answers in relation to some of our missing people. So until we meet again, Gurav Mila Mila Mahagwiv, Sloan August Banacht.
Thank you.